Uh, product School is all about talking about the entire process of how to build products. Um, and I've had a couple of classes here before which were how to build generic products where I talked through how to, get, how to get the voice of the customer, how to structure ambiguous scenarios, your ambiguous customer needs into frameworks, and then how do you translate those requirements to metrics and measure them. Uh, and based on popular demand, there was an ask to do a more niche, uh, niche presentation on how to build AI products, and that's why I'm here today. So as Brian said, I'm going to be giving you a quick overview of the process. And uh, I know there are a lot of financial analysts, data analysts, people who work with data, machine learning here. So 10 years ago, I worked on data analytics, and uh, specifically data quality, data preparation, way before AI was born. And data quality is not sexy. So, but, so there is always a path from the not sexy to the super sexy areas. So hang in there, especially if you're a data junkie, the future is bright for you. So, so really, it's a talk about AI, but it's a talk about data and how we can deliver meaningful user impact, how to marry the user scenarios in the natural language processing with AI. So let's get started. Awesome. So what am I going to cover today? So someone asked me, hey, what is your agenda for today? I'm going to cover that on the next slide. But quickly, before we get started, why AI? Why do we need AI? Other than the obvious, you know, AI works for free versus humans. Not always do. Yes? Well, the volume of data is, in, is increasing exponentially. If you just look at healthcare, yes. it's growing so fast. You really need something to kind of lasso around, the, you know, around all the data so that you can make meaningful information, actual information, off of the insights that are, are kept shut. So that's, yes. that's a reason why. It, it, the financial reasons is it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. It is the end of this year and it will yeah. be growing and growing. Yeah, absolutely, right? So, um, sorry, I didn't catch your name before. Oh, Allison. Allison. Allison touched upon big data, really, which is the volume, variety, and I always miss the third view. The volume, variety, and the velocity of data are ever increasing. So that was the age of big data. And now, now that we have the big data, the cloud services that can help us make sense of the data, how can we slap a natural language interface on top of that and have AI have a more human element? So that's what I'm mostly going to touch on, especially in the early stages of AI product definition. How can we make AI human? That's something we can talk about today. So any other, uh, any other uh, responses to why AI? Anyone? Hi, NKIM. I didn't see you there. So NKIM is a budding, awesome, rock star product manager at Microsoft who will be sharing her deep insights on how to build online search engines and online AI products. Feel free to chime in whenever, OK? Awesome, sorry to put you on the spot. Okay, so agenda, finally we get to your slide. Um, so this is what I'll cover today. What are the components of an AI system? Uh, what is the AI product lifecycle, like Brian mentioned? And uh, what are the types of AI products? And then we can, I want to reserve a lot of time for Q&A, so we can have a discussion and get your feedback on, hey, what is, what is most valuable here? Where would you like to go deeper? Components of an AI system. I touched upon this basic um, earlier, starts with data, right? This is where the financial analysts of the world, all the data analysts of the world will jump for joy because data is an essential part of the AI ecosystem. Um, and it's also often the most challenging piece to get right. It's also the most essential uh, piece to get right before you get started. Um, and then what makes a system move from a big data system to an AI system is this, the natural language interface, as well as the deep machine learning components that drive automated reasoning. So those who attended my uh, product management talk, was anyone here for the product management talk that I gave in July and August? Cool. OK, cool. So there I talked about you know, three basic stages of building products, which are plan, define, and execute. The same three stages apply to building AI products as well. But what is most important and different with AI is that you need to really simplify. Very often we try to boil the ocean in terms of AI, right? Self-driving cars. But that's not the only AI solution. We can simplify to make a simple machine learning model, again, starting with the voice of the customer and identifying that one metric that we can really move and then building that reasoning capability with an ML model can help, can help simplify your problem space and define and launch your product. So define. 
Voice of the customer, exactly right, right? Every AI product begins with a great understanding of the user, the voice of the customer. Layer in your business understanding and really get specific on your data and machine learning um, and the machine learning metrics that you need to define. And this can vary by the user scenario and the user problem that you're trying to solve. For example, predicting, predicting the Seattle weather is a very different problem than classifying if it's going to be hot or cold or cloudy or rainy. Same problem space, different outcomes, different output values can define the ch or change your machine learning model. Um, so simplify. So how do you prepare the data? How do you make sure that there is no bias in the data? Those are parts of simplification and then the, imp the difference between traditional products and those of you who are working in online products or cloud services today are already familiar with the deployment life cycle, right? Services are always learning. An AI system always is more so, not just is, uh, is the AI system always learning, the AI system also needs to respond to feedback and adapt. So deployment is a super, it's not just enough to execute and ship your product, your product needs to continuously learn. So those are the three stages of an AI life cycle. Jumping into define, customer understanding, you love this. He was right on. Uh, we always start with the voice of the customer, even when we're building AI products, which are often seen as data heavy. We sometimes make the mistake of starting with the data, but it's always important to start with the user. And this is a framework I shared in my previous class. Jobs to be done is one of the frameworks we use in Bing today. We, we use it to deeply understand the value proposition we offer to the customer and boil it down to feature level scenarios. So what does it mean? What is the jobs theory? It's all about about distancing yourself from the product that you own. As product managers, we get very passionate about a product. It's important to distance ourselves from the product and think about the customer needs that we're trying to solve. So, coffee. What does coffee mean to you? Sanity. Sorry? Sanity. San sanity, exactly. She's ahead of the curve, right? Coffee, to most people, is just, okay, a hot cup of coffee, it's a beverage. But it's actually more than that, right? It gives you sanity. What else? What else does coffee do for you? Why would you hire a coffee? Friendliness in the morning. Friendliness in the morning. With yourself, towards others? others. Is, is, it, is, it, is it, what does friendliness mean? Is it a reason to meet a friend or is it make, it's something that makes me friendly? Makes, me makes you friendly. <laughs> yeah, the one rule of them I have is, don't talk to me before my second cup of coffee, right? I'm not the nicest person in the world. So yeah, so again, that's an emotional trait that the product coffee embodies. So, and Starbucks uh, nailed it. Nespresso is another company that really nailed the art of making coffee, right? So what did Nespresso do? <coughs> Any take us, what did Nespresso do? That was so revolutionary. Instant coffee, yes, but what else? Self-service. Self Sorry? Very convenient. Very convenient. Yeah, yeah. Very convenient, popular. And then their marketing campaign, the way Nespresso brought their product to the market was they used George Clooney to tell the story to get the word out. <coughs> so they really tapped into the social and emotional aspect of things. That if, if I drink Nespresso, I'm as cool as George Clooney. Right? So there's the, the it factor, the branding, the exclusiveness. Nespresso, the, the quality of Nespresso is pretty bad, right? How many, how many coffee connoisseurs are here? I, I, yeah, right? So I, I'm from South India where we, where, where we have like a really high bar for coffee. We need to grind the coffee right before we drink it. So I can guarantee you the Nespresso bar for coffee, even though it's instant, is pretty bad. It's just not as tasty as fresh ground be uh, beans, not beef, fresh ground beans harvested from the farms or coffee plantation two weeks ago and ground the five minutes before I actually need the coffee. But they nailed the packaging, they nailed the exclusivity, they nailed what I call the social and economic aspects of coffee drinking. Yeah, Right? But, um, if I'm having a party or something and you need to pop those things in really fast, right. the Nespresso will mail you a whole tube, you order it online, and it'll be at your house the next morning. Exactly. That's Amazon. Oh, does Nespresso do it Nespresso themselves? Well, yeah. Oh, that's great. 
Maybe I should consider that. I use Amazon right now, but let's see. Okay, cool, that works. Now I can stay here and make Brian happy. Um, okay, so yes. So the, the thing that Nespresso and Starbucks really nailed were the social and emotional aspects of things. So I'm off on a tangent, but why is this important? When you think about AI, can AI improve the quality of your coffee? Not really, but AI can help you nail the customer service aspect of things. If you think about a chatbot, Starbucks having a chatbot, the chatbot is not going to improve the quality of your coffee, but it can feel, make you feel really good before you're that happy person. That chatbot in Starbucks can make you feel really happy. So when you're, before you get the coffee. Uh, so super important to really understand what are the social and functional aspects of the product that I'm trying to solve? Where can I move the needle with better data or better customer satisfaction. All right, so example, bad screenshot, but how many of you have heard of Zalish in China? Not to have a shameless plug for Microsoft here, but this is a chat bot. This is what she looks like, uh, but there are amazing pictures of her online. Um, she's a really hot Chinese lady, a uh, teenager. Really hot Chinese teenager. And she is, she's becoming everyone's best friend because she listens. She listens to all the, you know, anyone who speaks with her. Have you, have you, have you used, sorry, no, anyway. So she, she, she's, yeah, she's, she's really popular in China. All the kids love her, the teenagers. Um, they know all the, the, she knows their secrets and she listens and responds to them intuitively. So just an example of, when you think about building AI, think about the emotional and social aspects and how you can delight customers. Uh, because it's not often that you will actually impact product quality in a measurable way. All right, so then once we went, always start with the user, the customer, the next step is to think about the business consequences. This is often over overlooked. Um, so I work at Microsoft, but I, I, I have uh, I have friends, you know, in Google, I, Rajan Shet, and then Tesla, Uber, um, and how do we think about, and I, I, speak, I speak very much with leaders in Tesla and Google about how are they thinking about AutoML? What is autopilot? What is the future of autopilot in Tesla, for example? And, <clears throat> and Semantic Machines is a, is a new startup that Microsoft acquired, and in most of the scenarios, the thing that often gets overlooked is the business consequences. Um, a great example of this on the next slide, I'm going to jump ahead and then come back, is Expedia. Uh, Expedia, uh, Expedia released a chatbot, super successful. Um, and it was released, it did really well, there was hockey stick growth. Um, but very soon there were concerns, there was resistance from within Expedia because the chatbot was doing better than the call centers uh, and the people in the call centers. So, uh, and if you think about how did they make the chatbot in Expedia as successful as it was, because it was trained on human data generated by the call centers. So super important to keep in mind the human element and the business consequences and position your AI activity, your AI product in the right way to make sure it does not, um, it's, it's not met with resistance. And as AI product managers, it's our job to think ahead, plan for the future, expect resistance that comes down the road to build a business case and to, to drill down, break down resistance. So how does Microsoft do it? Um, these are, in the, in, across the industry, there's, there are fate principles. Uh, what is fate, fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics? Um, so ethics, Microsoft goes a step further and breaks down ethics into three areas. That's reliability and safety, privacy, security, and accountability. So what does that mean? So in, let's, as, uh, taking the case of the um, Expedia example, what does fairness mean? Fairness means that the chatbot will treat everyone with respect, including the, the human experts who were responsible for building the chatbot in the first place, right? So what does that mean in terms of educating our travel agents? Um, just with the advent of cars, we had, what, what did we have before cars? Horses. Horses, right? So with the advent of cars, we had 
we had we had we needed experts that either rode horses, drove carriages, etc. But with the advent of cars, we needed folks who could drive the cars. So similarly with AI, we need human experts who can train the system. That's the benefit of AI. So it's important to position AI as a fair for all <laughs> scenario that can help and train the human experts help them get better and help them enhance their skills, which are about optimizing an AI system versus perceiving their jobs to be at risk. This seems like a lot of legal BS, but as product managers, you will face resistance. It's not about slapping a machine learning. We'll get to the you know, various models you need to do, you know, regression versus classification, but it's important when you start out, when you're building the business case, to think through the business consequences, and this is a good framework that you can use. Um, we can dive into that later. So what's the third piece? This is the data understanding. This is where you know, our financial analysts and data analysts jump for joy. Um, so everyone's heard about all the issues with facial recognition recently, right? Can anyone enlighten the room? Yes? China uh, is using facial recognition, I think, and it's a little, it, it's, it's a little experimental as to classifying whether people are good people or not people. Yes. Cool. That actually goes back to the previous sli slide where we talked about, uh, or where I talked about ethics, right? So just today, Brad Smith of Microsoft um, uh, published the, the building on the FATE principles, principles for facial recognition, which said we will always have consent. We will always, we will not uh, do unlawful surveillance. So we'll always have permission. And we, there will be no discrimination. The other example, why, why we have Voldemort right here, is because of Google Photos. Uh, Google Photos, some of you might know, was classifying um, people of a certain race as gorillas. Um, and and um, I've, this, that's one example, uh, not, I mean, I mean, I'm sure Microsoft has similar problems. Uh, and then we have hair dryers. Hair dryers don't work well for people of color, and I can attest to this, um, because uh, of the illumination, the, the, when, you, when you place your hand under the hair dryer, there is a different kind of illumination based on your hair color. Hair color. So how can we build inclusive products? How can we uncover the bias? Uh, has been a topic of debate, right? And there are easy, the, 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 quick, um, the quick tip for you here is there are two main types of bias, and they're usually related to race and gender. So just make sure that when you're building your test cases for your AI system, when you're, when you're, um, when you're speaking with your voice of the, uh, when you're getting your voice of the customer, when you're speaking with your customers, make sure that they represent the diversity of the application that you're building. For facial recognition, make sure you have people of all races, all genders, all facial types. Um, facial recognition is just scratching the surface. When you think about emotion recognition, um, I have what, what people call the resting bitch face. So I'm always frowning unless I'm making an active effort to smile. So it, when, when we talk about emotion, uh, emotion understanding, we need to not just incorporate race and gender and face types, also measure the nuances of how people emote differently. So make sure, the, the only thing I can say is, as AI product managers, make sure your test cases represent the diversity of your application. Um, and hire a diverse workforce. So someone talked about data, data in healthcare. Was that you? Yeah. That was you, great. So, uh, so I work on, um, I'm part of the extended team, work with a team of data scientists that are uncovering root causes for sudden infant death syndrome. Um, that is a hugely complex problem. We have a Bayesian network now, but how did we do it? We knew from the start that we, um, uh, we, would, we would have bias in our data set because it's very hard to collect tissue samples for, for sudden infant death syndrome. Why? Because these are infants that passed away. We need parental consent. We need to reach out to parents right before their baby has just passed away. We only have 250 tissue samples. And we had to plan for bias by making sure they could be as diverse as possible. One of the and the two, first, first two factors that we uncovered were smoking is a strong, strong indicator uh, that puts babies, the mom smoking during and before pregnancy is a strong uh, risk factor for SIDS. The second, uh, the second insight was Latin American and black population are at high risk for SIDS. So 
but when we, when we accounted for smoking, it really was a correlation of black American and Latin population to smoking and not really SIDS. So this is, 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 is an example to bring out what I have here, the last point here, which is unconscious bias. We're all aware and we look for biases for race and gender, but sometimes there can be unconscious bias in our data sets. And the best example is, is, is what I mentioned, but also location, right? Uh, where you live, whether it's Harlem, downtown, uptown, can be a great indication of your race. The only way that we can be sure as product managers is make sure that we work with our data scientists to review the model outputs for bias and look for correlations. Always look for correlations to race, gender, and age. So that's data understanding. We'll, we'll talk more about data in the next life cycle. But, um, in, in step one, while you're building your business case as a product manager, make sure your data set is diverse and look for biases in the data. Um, just an example. Great tool. Has anyone used this? I apparently look like uh, Rachel Wise, uh, the lady from The Mummy. Uh, surprisingly, this works for guys too. Uh, even though it's a predominantly female set of celebrities. Um, but I spoke, spoke to most of these. Think about, think about facial types, colors, tones. What are some other, um, if you were building this product, how would you make sure that your data set is unbiased? You can have a, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Gender, age. Yep. So let's throw in. Size. Sorry. Sample size. Sample size. Yep. Sample size. Yep. So yep. Yep. These are things I don't have here. Absolutely. So in addition to optimizing for facial structure and tones and emotions, think about representing the diversity of the world and make sure your sample size is good enough. Yeah. <coughs> Metric understanding. So once you have your data set, really think about how you're going to move the needle. Um, the number one thing that I want to say here is make sure that you have the instrumentation needed to make sure you can measure the outcomes that you want. If you want to improve the, the, the impact you have on, on, the, on, on the Starbucks experience, how are you going to translate that to metrics that you can actually measure? Question to you how, would you, how would you, as a product manager, define a metric that measures the quality of the Starbucks experience? What are, what are some tools or techniques you would use? Quantify what success looks like and what are the attributes that will, that will calculate that for you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's uh, brand, uh, product brand uh, brand, how much the touch points on your brand are you hitting, mm -hmm. um, how many units are you selling, uh, you know, where the, the, how much community, where the drivers for community, building community. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So the number, the best thing that she mentioned was, did we sell? Did we sell more coffee? Did we sell more product? That is, that is a great metric that ultimately tells you what the success of your AI product is. Another way to measure uh, impact is usually if you're building an AI product, it's going to show up in a mobile app or some mobile interface. Um, star rating, Uber uses this a lot. Expedia uses it a lot. Uh, quick at the end of the session, using a survey to measure the, uh, measure the satisfaction of your customer experience is a great way to define a metric and m measure meaning and movement in the metric before you see uptick in your product sales. So, so just get really specific about the metrics that you're going to define because that determines how you're going to sell and get sponsorship for your product. Task and domain selection. So what do you do when you don't have enough data? So we talked a lot about, you know, yeah, you have the data, diversify the data. What do you do when you don't? So a great example is we are building um, assistance for, um, let's say Calendly.com or Grammarly.com was, was building assistant for a new type of proofreading software uh, that helps you determine uh, 
how, how casual do you need to be when you write your resume, when you're applying for new jobs? How casual can you really be and be your authentic self on your resume? Uh, no one has thought of this problem before. There is no data to measure success. So how do you, how do you get the data going? How do you get the flywheel going? How do you define the uh, test cases? So, um, so these all boil down to natural language problems. They're less data driven, but they're natural language expressions. And two great resources you can use as product managers are ClickWorker. We use ClickWorker as USR, UHRS. We use that at Microsoft. Uh, Mechanical Turk is, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is, a, is another, um, it's a bunch of gig, gig economy workers who can basically tell you, they, 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 they self-select themselves as domain experts in let's say travel or weather or calendaring. Um, um, and they can, and you can ask them. Hey, if if I had to, if I was building a, a software that helps me determine what my tone should be in my resume, uh, what are the types of sentences you would use? Um, and for three types of tone: professional, moderate, and casual. What are the phrases that you would use? And they can actually generate that data set for you. So again, this goes back to the domain experts. You have this at your disposal. If you have no existing data when it's a brand new domain, lean on these resources. So we talked about five to six steps. Uh, and what, what, is, what is the outcome? The outcome of phase one is to help you find your niche, right? And the niche lies at the intersection of customer business and data. And it helps you articulate AI value in terms of these four areas. Uh, we talked about increasing product sales, but AI's value can also be in cost reduction, in addition to the touchy-feely customer experience satisfaction, there's cost reduction. Uh, hey, you can grow your business uh, because of cost savings, or you can grow your business because you can improve the customer experience in store. Brand value, I think someone mentioned this. Reducing risk, especially if you think about fraud detection systems, financial services, risk reduction, fraud, spam reduction is a huge reason why they invest in AI. Um, and then delighting customers, again, the socioeconomic, and then the usability. Um, using Expedia is easier. It helps me find the best hotel because the chatbot helped me through my options. Or the, or the chatbot helped me find options offline and gave me recommendations when I woke up in the morning. So, so finding your niche, super important as a product manager. Use the steps that I described above to find your niche, which lies at the intersection of these three. All right, so uh, question to you. This is an interview question for AI product managers. Um, how would you improve YouTube's recommendation engine? Oops. Yes? Relevance based off of what I'm already searching on in Google. Mm -hmm. There are no wrong answers. Yes, go ahead. I, I, I would think relevance, so oftentimes I search for things on YouTube, and sometimes it's kind of hit or miss. Mm -hmm. So if I'm interested in a Google search, Google, YouTube owns Google, Google owns YouTube. Um, relevance to the topic or subject matter that I'm after and then show most popular or most recent and things like that. Yep, absolutely. So <clears throat> when, when, when you're being asked this in a product manager interview, they're looking for your, the process you use to, um, to, boil, to break down this problem. Right? You talked about metrics, which is great. Right? Uh, you, as a, as a product manager, would use relevance of the recommendations as a, as a yes, as a consumer as well as product manager. You would use the relevance um, as a metric. What else would you do before you get to the metric? What, what, how would you answer this question in an interview? I mean, it's the problem. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the problem? Why do you want to improve it? Where yep. is your data set? Mm -hmm. Where is the failure? Mm -hmm. That should channel to what you need to improve. Yeah, right on. How would you go about finding those pain points? <clears throat> well, we would probably analyze what are the current recommendations that mm -hmm. are given by mm -hmm. YouTube to the customers. Yep. And okay. yep. Are, they, are they using those recommendations? Or are they saying, oh, this is yep, yep. So that's that's exactly that's relevance. Uh, some le level of precision and recall. And Kim, any uh, any any answers to this question? No. Okay. 
I should stop putting her on the spot. So yes, so um, understand, benchmark, understand you know, existing precision and recall. Analyze the root cause. Are there certain categories where you know, um, YouTube recommendations are better than others? Um, understand the data set. You know, what, are the, what are the categories, genres of music? Or is, maybe it's beyond music. The YouTube has games. What are the categories of data that we have? Is one area better than the other? So getting to the root cause of the problem. Another one is, you know, my customer fan would, would love, love it now that I'm saying, go talk to customers, YouTube users, and talk to them about areas for improvement. Um, and then that becomes your voice of the customer. Uh, I talked about jobs to be done. What I didn't mention is a great way to write your customer story is situation, expected outcome, um, Situation expected outcome. That's pretty much it. So I, when when I have when I have an accident, right? I need to receive immediate care, uh, so my family can be uh, relaxed and and worry free, right? So um, that's it's a great way. Situation and expected outcome is a great way to frame your customer responses and your customer needs. Um, so you can really put yourself in the customer shoes once you have your root causes write them down in terms of job stories, prioritize them, use your affinity diagrams, your two by twos to prioritize, cut things that are not needed and plan your MVP. Also think about consequences with AI. I don't Do you have a question? Like, I, I, I use YouTube quite a bit mm -hmm. actually and um, I'm see whether you're asking for feedback loop on a lot of this. Yeah, stuff. one of the challenges with YouTube is, so Spotify, when you, when you like when you like some, when you like a song on Spotify or even Netflix, uh, maybe not so much Netflix, but mainly Spotify, Pandora, all the music streaming stations, they update your recommendations. Your next song exactly. is immediately updated. So they do a great job of explicit versus implicit feedback. They use both, but you and and it's real time. Um, but uh, YouTube, I know, has only an offline path. They update in future sessions, but they don't do in-session personalization. Um, so that, that, yeah. But, but they don't do any personalization at all. Like if you look at Quora, Quora mm -hmm. you kind of have to pick out what your interests, it, it's a different example, but uh, mm. you have to kind of pick out what are your likes or dislikes and so forth, and these are certain Right. And then you, you update in real time, kind of like right. you know, or these other services, uh, up to up like or I don't like it, and then it, it, it keeps refining what it's served Yes. Up. Yes, so they don't have any explicit personalization story, but they do have an implicit backend algorithm that runs that optimizes based on your historical views and recommends. And it, they also have a historical crowdsourced machine learning algorithm that, um, that changes playlists based on most viewed songs. But you're absolutely right, there is no explicit, they don't have a way to solicit user feedback and they don't have a way to update it real time. So no explicit recommendations. So great, yeah. So awesome, lot of, lots of ideas. Structure your problem. Use the five steps uh, when you're answering this if you ever interview for an AI product manager role. All right, so that's, that's phase one. Now we're headed into simplification. Okay, so data preparation. <clears throat> Um, so where we are in the AI product lifecycle, we've built the business case. We have a great team of data scientists. I don't have a slide on you know, what your team should look like, but I'm going to cover it anyway. Um, so you, you would generally have a, a AI product manager who's responsible for multiple AI products. You'd have some technical PMs who can product manage. That's optional, depending on your company. Then you have your, your real, you know, the power behind the wheel, your data scientists, who, um, who should be your, you know, the first people you, um, you gather support for, you ask for, because they're going to help you simplify, translate your customer problem into a solvable problem and identify what is the right machine learning algorithm you can use on the back end. Um, so even before you involve the data scientists, I know there are some data engineers here, data engineer, right? Data engineers, super, super important part of your AI product ecosystem because the number one complaint from data scientists is we spend 80% time on, our, on data preparation. We are PhDs, we're too good for this. Um, and a lot of your, you know, as, as any product manager, right? Um, Especially if you are more in the execution side of things, you know, product managers come in all shapes and forms. Uh, product managers often thought of as the quarterback 
really they're the safety. We make sure that things don't go wrong. We make sure that the team is well oiled and operating at the highest morale possible, right? We need to make sure that we have data engineers who feel empowered and that they're working on great AI problems, impact, having direct impact on the customer, as well as making sure we're also protecting data scientists in the actual model implementation versus data preparation. So making sure that your, your team is well oiled, thinking about um, where is your data? Uh, where is your data and what are the transformations you need to make on your data before your data scientists can consume it, right? And you may, you may have a TPM or a data engineer that helps you. Sometimes as a product manager in a startup, you might need to roll up your sleeves. Having a data background as an AI product manager, super useful. Um, you need five, five basic checks. Is your data correct? Um, uh, is, is, is what the user entering actually seen in the data, data store. For example, UTC to PST conversion is, is an excellent example of changes that can happen in the data. Does your data conform to privacy and legal implications? Make sure that when you're, when you're training your machine learning model, you're only using data that user has consented to use. Uh, for machine learning purposes, um, because there are some there's some data that you can use for analytics, but not really improvement on the user side. Um, is it current? Make sure you're learning. Given the pace at which we move these days, make sure that you're not using data that's four years old. That's at least you know past six months is a good uh, time frame. Uh, make sure your data is consistent. Uh, that the same actions reveal the same output data over time. So it just come, goes back to having your test cases right. Um, and consolidation. What does consolidation mean, right? We, we talked a little bit about um, weather forecasts. We can either predict the weather for tomorrow, or we can classify weather as sunny, rainy, cloudy, snowy, right? The first one is more of a, a regression algorithm. The second one is a classification model. Um, so, and the data that you need to store for the, for, the, for the classification algorithm is labeled data set that has a list of weather values surrounding climate conditions and labeled as one of those four, sunny, snowy, cloudy, rainy. For the, the other scenario, which is predicting the value of Seattle weather, all you need is a list of his, just, just the number, the numeric value of Seattle weather over the past five to 10 years. And you can determine the time frame based on your model's precision and probability and um, uh, whatever your model parameters are. It varies by the model. Um, so all you need is a set of values that you can use to predict. So make sure your data is consolidated based on the output that you want. You should know by now whether you're predicting weather type or the actual temperature. Um, and that will become part of your data definition. Um, and con conforming to these four, four C's I added consolidation, uh, so it's five C's now. Um, and your end goal is reduce bias, so your models are not under, your models are not underfitted. And you reduce noise. Noise happens when you have too much data and then your model starts detecting patterns, detect, detects noise as a pattern, and then so the, you overfit the model. So they're opposite ends of the spectrum, so you need to right-size your application. Um, and there are various steps. You can read through them. You'll get the slides later. Uh, but this is the most challenging uh, part. It is easily 60%, 70%. Go ahead. Very people, but at the end, you find that you know, like you are you are selling more Starbucks coffee to one group of people. Like essentially, the bias still comes. It took like you you did all the all the work you had to do. What do you do then? So the question is, you 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 stratified your data. You had, you had a diverse population of Starbucks users which had all races, all genders, but, in the, but you optimized your product in some way that you were only catering to one group of the population. Um, in that case, I would uh, basically look for correlation. What are the factors that, 
wh where's the affinity between this population and the factors that you optimized? Um, and is there, what are the other reasons? You would have to peel the, peel the layers of your algorithm to understand correlation and causation uh, across your various subgroups that you identified to see if there are other factors um, that, are, that are influencing. So l taking the case of, to make it more tangible, regression, right? A great way to, we, there's the, I'm going to speak in stats terms, there's R squared and R squared adjusted for those who know stat, stats. R squared tells you basically you have enough variables in your algorithm um, that, 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 can, that, that can help you predict with reasonable confidence. R squared adjusted, when, when the value of R squared adjusted goes down, you know that you have too many variables that you're using. So in the case of regression, there are two, there are two metrics. One, R squared, which helps you understand if you've eliminated bias. And R squared adjusted, which tells you when you're moving towards the other side and you need to reduce the variables, not overfit. So for every model has these parameters. So to answer your question, look at the model, understand, um, for decision trees, we have, you know, what is your genie impurity? Look at that value and understand. In the case of, a, of an algorithm like a decision tree, they are the perfect example where you might have released your decision tree for a set of circumstances, but they are very amenable to changes in the business environment. So your underlying assumptions might have changed. You might have more white people coming into your Starbucks in winter, so they might be other variables like weather, seasonality, that are contributing to the factors. Uh, the answer to your question is understand the model, understand the business. That's the only way you can decipher why it's happening. But, yeah. 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 And then, like, so the output would be like more white people buying more coffee. Yeah. How do you actually, like, uh, handle that and, like, even like otherwise, if you see like oh, there is a problem, do you actually uh, like you see like you know we have to uh, change some variables, yes. but that would actually decrease your. Uh, yeah, so that that's when um, go back to this um, when you don't have enough data. When you don't have enough data, you can tap into these artificial data generation sources to validate if your algorithm still works when your input is truly diversified as you trained your model. So you can tap into ClickWorker and Turks to generate that data and represent the other subset of the population that you don't have right now represented in your population. And make sure that the model still holds true. If it does, then you know that your algorithm is still doing what it's supposed to do. It's just there's a change in the environment. But if you find that the model is not performing in, in label data, in artificially generated label data, then you know you need to go back and change your algorithm. Okay, okay, cool. So this is another stage of AI product design that gets overlooked. We often think of AI as these complex black box machine learning models and we lose sight of the user experience. And we often only when we realize we you know we we release facial recognition software then we re when then we realize that it's biased towards certain groups in order to avoid such bias the best way to in your simplification phase is to use you know humans as heroes um, and then honor diversity again so this means we, we, we gathered our user feedback in the early stage here it's about usability testing of your experience, of your natural language response with a diverse group. So it, it goes back to voice of the customer, but a different flavor um, about usability testing of your product versus just gathering data. Um, and then, excellent, you, you really jumped the gun. You need to understand the context and evolve over time and constantly reevaluate if your model is performing uh, and if the situations that you assumed are still true. Um, so this is just a softer aspect of AI that you need to keep in mind. It's not just about data. Um, diversity has a place. If you're, if you're educated in the humanities, if you're a great UX designer, you still have value. That's something that you can lean into. That can be your secret sauce as an AI product manager. So think about data, think about UX. Um, and there are lots of examples um, 
that Microsoft has Google DeepMind is a great example of amplifying human ingenu ingenuity. The best example is where we're changing the world for people with disabilities um, and in healthcare. Those are the top two scenarios where you can really see this come to life and you can use those as analogies and case studies as you build your AI product. Model selection. So we talked about this a little bit. Um, so once you've built your business case, you've prepared your data, you have an understanding of what the output is going to be. Um, you also have an understanding of how users are going to deeply interact with your product. Uh, you have them as your heroes. You have these human experts giving you feedback. Then it is time to just rely on your data scientist to determine which algorithm to use. You can understand there's an Azure ML cheat sheet that, that's pretty descriptive that details all the ML algorithms that you would ever need to know. But as product managers, you don't need to know um, the exact metrics. I mean, I have read it. I understand it. I know the basic metrics of the top four machine learning algorithms. But um, it's for me to have a conversation with data scientists. I'm never going to be, I'm never going to write Python code. I'm never going to write R code. Um, and uh, if anything, I can be a data engineer. That's it, right? And so don't expect your, don't hold yourselves to that bar. Have a basic understanding of machine learning, but rely on your data data scientists. At this stage, they are doing most of the work. They are the heroes of your product. Um, but basic terminology: there are three groups of machine learning: supervised, unsupervised, batch, or online. This is super important. Um, as you think about scoping and growing your team. Right, uh, the amount of data directly determines how much compute capacity you need to fight for and ask get sponsorship for in terms of servers. Is it more, you know, more Azure capacity? Do you need to you do do we need Kubernetes? What what are the containers we need? These are decisions you'll need to make as a product manager. And an easy way to simplify is always go for batch processing versus online processing, especially in the proving out phases of building and training your algorithm. Batch environments are enough for learning, um, unless you have. Um, like Uber has, even their learning systems uh, sometimes need to be based on stream analytics. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Um, and then uh, classification versus predicting. You'll need to go to this level of depth uh, because that determines the data set and the compute capacity. If you need to d store four values, um, like in the classifying weather example, you'll need more capacity than if you were just storing a, a string of integers. So. Um, under the hood, just rely on your data scientists, know enough to speak the jargon. Uh, but some quick quizzes. If you were to classify cheese types, you were classifying cheese into Brie, Mexican, mozzarella, what machine learning algorithm would you use? Oh, there are four types. There's classification, regression, clustering, and anomaly detection. Of those four, what makes sense? Great. Classification, awesome. Do we know the top types of classifications, classification models? Anyway, quick cheat sheet, decision trees, SVMs, done. Experts, next, uh, what model will you choose for, um, for uncovering weather trends? Uncovering weather trends. Yes, unsupervised clustering is a great example. Um, Awesome. To forecast the next 10 days of weather. Perfect. Awesome. You guys are all budding AI product managers. What model will you choose to find anomalies? If you're a data quality data engineer, what algorithm would you use? I mean, you can use a simple rule-based you know, procedural algorithm to detect it. But what type of machine learning algorithm would you use for anomaly detection? SVM actually does it, yes, very good. Even though that's a very great point. SVM, though it's a classification algorithm, is great for de uh, detecting anomalies as well. Um, there are also, uh, there's an anomaly detection algorithm that's there in the Azure ML cheat sheet, which you can look at it. There's also, call, uh, there's also PCD, there's kernel reduction algorithms that you can use, read about it. Um, great point on SVM, I don't know who said it. Uh, for fraud, similar to SVM, you can use logistic uh, regression. Um, because it classifies your output in terms of two values. So your SVMs, logistic regression, even regression, are multi-purpose machine learning models that you can use for many scenarios. So a um, great book, I don't have it here, is <clears throat> Sci-Fi Learning Toolkit. Have you read it? 
Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll add it to my deck. Uh, it's great reading if you want a precursor to uh, ML algorithms and the four main types. So that's all you need to know. Great. So model evaluation. So this is an example of you know matrix completion algorithm that one of my data scientists built. Um, uh, as an example, the customers also bought in Amazon. Customers also bought. That's essentially a matrix completion algorithm. And um, and the, how they test it is they they create a matrix of all products. They remove some products from the matrix, and they and then they run the model on the on the test data set, and they see. How, how close it was to the, the original matrix that was created. Just, you know, so this is one example of a way to test your machine learning model. Uh, the testing process varies by the machine learning model that you use. The important takeaway here is find when, read your papers. As product managers, you'll need to read these papers that are most suitable. Once your, your data scientist team picks a certain algorithm, goes down a certain path. As product managers, just read the paper to understand what are the metrics and what is the best way to test the data set so you can have the right discussion uh, and balance the needs of the user. Uh, the other uh, reason uh, this is important is data scientists always, they, they love to be perfect. But perfection is not always the solution. Best case is for fraud detection algorithms. We don't want the fraud detection algorithm to be like super accurate in detecting non-fraud. We want it to be super accurate in detecting even the, the smallest chance of fraud. So balance model performance with accuracy and make sure you're using the levers accurately. We had a great question already. What happens when you know, our business environment changes what can we do as AI product managers? This will happen. Um, AI is a living system. It's like a human. It needs to constantly adapt, learn, and grow. The person you were last year is not the person you are today. So the AI machine is the same way. It learns daily. Um, so deployment and ongoing learning is super important. How can you as an AI product manager manage this? Visualize the heck out of your data set. Understand the, the metrics. For, uh, for your models and make sure that there are dashboards available. Uber does a great job, and I'm gonna go deeper into the Michelangelo platform. They have amazing metrics that help them visualize the models they have, and they have a feature repository um, that can help them productize and have other teams tap into existing models that have been built for certain scenarios. Um, the other important piece during model deployment, back to your question, is you, need to, you might need to scale data collection based on your changing needs uh, or scale scenario coverage. So let's say you, you released a recommendation algorithm for action movies, uh, but you're seeing users are seeing more romance movies. Then you need to make sure that your, your, your training data now includes romance movies. You have test cases built for it. Um, and then that your measurement system also accounts for it. Um, Scaling action movie recommendations to new segments, totally different problem than, than um, scaling overall movie recommendations from US to UK. So think about what your problem is and appropriately scale the data, right? Um, does that make sense? I know it made sense to you who asked the question. Um, anyway, so just to double click into that. Um, action movie recommendations. Scaling that to a new segment, just make sure you have a representative set. Action movie to romance movie, make sure you have scalable set of romance movies. That's it, simple. When you're scaling overall movie recommendations to a new group of users, um, you need to make sure that you are including all movie categories accurately so your recommendations can be reliably generated across all movie categories versus previously you just have to make sure that you are representing the diversity of the world within the romance category so hope that made sense um, so yeah and use visualization um, another uh, optimization technique yeah mm -hmm. yeah how do you select the movies? Like, let's say you are selecting romantic movies and then you are selecting action movies, uh, but these uh, the romantic movies you selected might not be that good. Or if you are gonna try to select by ratings, uh, one of one movie kind like would might be usually low rated. 
Like yeah. So basically, you're saying you have a list of, you have a collection of hundred romance movies, but you don't know how good they are. Go, go back to your judges. Get, get judges, click workers or Turks to classify your romance movies as good, bad, ugly, and start with that. Um, so once you have the label data, separate that into training data set, test data set, and then ra build the model on the training data set, and then test it on the test data set. So use humans wherever you can to label your data sets. That's the answer, when you don't have data. So in and, data yes. uh, how large should be the test data set compared yeah. to training data sets? Yeah. So that's a great question, right? So my statistics uh, sampling uh, knowledge tells me my sample data set should be 5% of the population. Um, so I use 1 divided by root n as a rule of thumb, where n is the total population, to determine my sample size. Uh, it may not be feasible, uh, but again, that screenshot I have here that talks about your machine learning algorithm, this basically, if you really peer deeply into it, that says, hey, if you have more than 50 samples, you can, you can actually run dimensionality reduction or clustering, right? So you have that, the answers right here. Just look deeply at this chart. But this, is, this oversimplifies this a little bit. I like to use 1 divided by root n as the best value for sample size. How do you evaluate that? It's all prediction, right? It's not the accurate uh, exact things we do. Your sample size should be accurate. That formula should be uh, accurate. Uh, but maybe you're asking something different. For sample size, you, can, you, should, you should be able to know whether you have enough or not. And you should be able to, uh, when you, even when you don't have enough, you should be able to create label data um, to meet your needs. Um, but are you asking, how do I know if there is bias in my data set? That each model has built-in uh, built parameters. For example, decision trees have the Gini index or the entropy values. Regression has R squared. Uh, RMSC is the right terminology. So uh, each model has a way to, uh, uh, to avoid bias and eliminate noise. Um, your data scientist can help you define that, or you, a quick uh, online search should reveal it as well. It determines on your sample size the type of algorithm. Um, so um, within, within classification, Right? You have uh, SVMs and you have decision trees. Decision trees, you can light them up real quick on a smaller data set. But SVMs need a larger sample size. So you can make trade-offs in your algorithm that you choose as well if you have smaller data. But this is a good cheat sheet for you that tells you, hey, if you have this sample size, you can use this algorithm. And the link is right here. And if you have more questions, reach out to me. LinkedIn, Twitter, email. Any questions, comments? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Also, just take into consideration like what is your experience. Yeah. So, for example, with movies, <coughs> such like market specific in comic book play, um, a product that I own, for example, is like flight statuses. So, if you think about how different will someone in the US was seeing you came for a flight status or so book a flight, pretty much going to be the same. So, in that case, when you're training that sort of model, if you can probably use like as much as possible, you want to diversify. Yeah. So you may not see so much variation. Versus like a movie or like a model. <coughs> yeah. Any model that scales, but at the same time hits those bars if it is market specific for Japanese adventure movies. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, for example, when that's a great point. Like what when reality meets perfection, right? Essentially, uh, the rule of thumb we use. Search engines are easier, right? Um, e and star. Any any English speaking country is easier to localize than, than you know, markets or countries that speak different languages. The same largely applies. Um, but if you have the budget, sanity check with new label data from click workers that are specific to your market. Um, but also understand affinity to existing markets to see how bold you can be in bending the rules. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Going back, I love it. So many questions. OK, my favorite, Michelangelo. <laughs> Michelangelo platform. OK, so we talked about online versus offline. Um, 
This is, this is how Uber does. Uber's engineering team is simply amazing. Uh, one of my mentors just left Uber, unfortunately. Um, and um, so he actually built the growth platform for Uber, um, <clears throat> his engineering team, really, because he was a GPM at Uber. And we all know product managers don't do anything. Um, so my mentor's engineering team built this amazing platform um, where they have, they, they have, as you know, Uber Eats, you need real-time estimation of how soon your driver is going to you know, get to your um, doorstep, when is your driver going to get to you for your pickup. So they needed a strong online recommendation system as well as an offline recommendation system. Um, if you're an AI product manager, good to know. Spark, read, read about Spark, read about stream analytics. Kafka, another buzzword, read about it. Uh, data lakes. Data lakes are usually offline repositories. Massive, massive, lots of information, data um, that you can use to train and optimize precision of your algorithms. When you need fast online systems, always use Kafka. I say stream analytics because that was the Microsoft product, but any um, Spark Spark does uh, has a stream uh, streaming solution. Storm uh, is um, is another technology that. Um, all this is open source, by the way. This is not Microsoft. Uh, Storm is another technology that Uber and all the you know, non-Microsoft companies use. Um, Cassandra. Cassandra is essentially Cosmos DB in Microsoft. Also DynamoDB in AWS, I think. Um, so they, they, you, you, you get your streaming data from Kafka. You process it into streams. You store it in Cassandra. You feed Cassandra to your feature store. Uh, this is a list of all features. This is your input to your models. Um, uh, Hive is a great, is just like SQL. You can query it. Um, and then you run your batch. Uh, batch processing algorithms, but at the same time, this is for your offline models and analytics. Um, Uber built a way to feed Cassandra straight into their stream processing real-time predict service to power Uber Eats. Um, so the goal of showing this slide is for you to know some of the top technologies that you need to read about if you're going for a product manager interview. Example, Uber Eats. Uh, I touched upon this. If, um, what are the parameters, if you were a product manager designing Uber Eats, what are the parameters you would optimize for beyond, um, beyond travel time? <clears throat> And let's get more specific. You're the Uber Eats product manager responsible for the your favorites list within the Uber Eats app. And you need to come up with the three variables that you will use to, f to train the algorithm. One of them being distance, travel time. What are some other variables? Frequency of when I've ordered, um, like in the list yep, recently. perfect. What, what type of food, like is it Thai food or is it this type of food and serving me different options under that same umbrella? Jean, yeah, cuisine, taste, yes. Also, what time I'm ordering? Yes. Uh, Open hours, exactly. Um, and yeah, favorites based on, um, based on time of day. Awesome. Do you know what, uh, I use AW, uh, Amazon a bit on the food service and right there. Prime Now? I've tried Amazon. Yes. Amazon, yeah. Yes. Do you think they use the same type of AI model, or do we know that? Oh, I have no idea. Okay. I do know that DoorDash is the best, followed by Prime Now, followed by Uber Eats. Okay. In terms of, I believe, restaurant selection. So that's the other thing. There are offline metrics like restaurant selection that are also important that can help you optimize. So you, there are uh, variables specific to restaurant, and then just improving relevance and improving coverage. Those are the two things that you can always play with. Okay, cool. So we're, we're done with the meat, uh, meat of the study of the AI product lifecycle. So now that we, we know the process, um, uh, when, what are some scenarios in which you would like to use AI? One of the things I, I'd like to understand about yeah. AI, at least, is I know it's a struggle to get companies to buy into this because there's a, there's a bit of resistance, even getting them to change yeah. one version yes. to another version. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So getting somebody to a business, uh, Microsoft's really interesting because you've got a great suite of enterprise customers. So that's a huge 
low hanging fruit of people to deal to work companies to work with. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? How are you engaging with some of these companies to say, can you carve out a project that we can work together yep. and partner with you to take it from? Bang on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Amazing. Ahead. Yeah. Oh, so it's it's all the AI. The AI first is the vision. This is where you know we have the self-driving cars, right? It's a, it's it's a, it's 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 tough to swallow for many companies. The level of investment you need to build a self-driving car equivalent, um, you would need to learn a lot before you can actually build that self-driving car. So this is why I keep talking about Rajen Sheth, and I have a link to his video. So Rajen is uh, GPM, Google Cloud ML, I believe, and Cloud and AI. So he has this great video that talks about these three types of technologies. And he actually, when he graduated from Stanford, I believe it was 20 years ago, he worked on self-driving cars. And he talked about uh, how they worked you know, with folks in the World Economic Forum. And there is a point to this, believe me, I'm getting to it in this story. Um, they worked with policymakers, lawmakers, the Congress people. Everyone was involved in the, in the ideation, in the genesis of self-driving cars. And they went nowhere because the world was not ready for self-driving cars. But in the next 20 years, self-driving cars came to, light, uh, came to life in bits and pieces. First is um, auto, not auto, autopilot is too, is, is blind spot detection, right? Then uh, tech, navigation, navigation maps, navigation that we take for granted today was a necessary invention before self-driving cars could come to life. Um, and then, then there, yeah, so then there's blind spot detection, na maps, navigation, and then autopilot. And these were important innovations and stages along the AI journey that had to happen before uh, you know, Tesla or Uber could build a self-driving car, or even Google, for example. Driverless cars could come to be. So what does that mean when you're working with a customer and they, they want to, everyone wants to, wants to be in the AI conversation? But what, how do you get started? Uh, Pre-AI is, is a valid alternative, and I can show you some examples. Um, how to think about these different paradigms is, pre-AI and AI inside um, sort of set the stage. Um, you, you're, you, you get your AI technology in there, you're incrementally improving user value, but you're not reducing, you're providing benefit to the user, but you're not reducing user effort in any way, right? I'm still driving the car, I need to be present. Um, it, yes, it, it helps, AI assists me, but AI is not reducing my effort in any way. When a, a truly AI first experience is where user effort goes down drastically, where while I'm commuting, I don't have to be driving, I can be reading a book, working, taking calls, and so on. So that's the true measure of success in the AI first world, but very, uh, many times you need to hold your customers along the journey. Um, and we did this with, I talked about cars, we did this with the steam engine as well. We had the sailboats, then we had sailboats with motor, and then we had Titanic which failed miserably, and then we have, uh, you know, ships that work. So that's, the, that's, that's AI, you know, it's, it's for sure gonna happen this way. So pre-AI, yeah, Bing, Google has this as well. Um, Auto-suggest, perfect example of pre-AI solutions where, yeah, we help surface relevant results. Search, search, Auto-suggest in search engines is an example of pre-AI. So moving on, what is AI inside? Google Photos. Again, Rajan does a much better job of explaining this than I do. As a result of Google Photos, can you guys comprehend the difference between auto-suggest in Google versus Google Photos? The difference? The difference mainly is with Google Photos, uh, go uh, pre-AI, Google auto-suggest just helps me, but Google Photos helps me connect all over the world, right? So I have, um, Google Photos also automatically recognizes uh, various people in my family, classifies them, helps me find photos. It helps my parents in India who have very limited technology skills to easily identify photos, to be up to date. There is a notifications capability. So it, it doesn't reduce any effort. They still have to open the computer, view the videos, but it keeps them educated, keeps people connected. Um, the same way Alexa excels in the shopping domain, and then we have uh, Google Photos, Google Assistant helping users perform tasks faster, benefiting
using them in unique ways, but not completely taking away AI effort. And then we have the self-driving car. Bits and pieces of it have already come to life. Putting them together, of course, is that's where you have the pieces, you probably have the data, right? You have the data, your system is learning, but you need a strong UX design skills for this experience to come together. Case study. How would you uh, build an AI experience for a restaurant? And think about, let's say you have a new customer, back to where you went, you have a new customer, and uh, this, is, this is Seattle Space Needle restaurant. This is McDonald's. They both come to you, AI product manager, we, need, we want AI, we want to, we want AI, that's it, please help us. Let's say McDonald's. McDonald's comes to you. How would you, how would you educate them as a product manager? What questions would you ask them? McDonald's, what, what do you want to do with AI? I don't know, uh, we just want to use AI to make our customer experience better. Maybe chatbots, start low end. Uh, yeah, low right, pre-AI solution lead them onto a pre-AI solution, a quick win, which they can celebrate, because you need to make them cool. The, the McDonald's IT team is coming to you for help. Um, go back to the value drivers I shared, right? What they, either cost reduction, risk reduction, customer delight, um, those are all parameters. You can ask them, which of these makes most sense to you? Um, here is a quick win that you can celebrate, get more funding for your AI project, and then move them along the way. Um, how about, how would that differ? If the Space Needle, is it SpaceX? What's the name of the restaurant? Space Needle. Space, uh, yeah. Uh, SpaceX. Is. Space, SpaceX is, oh, SpaceX, SpaceX is the company. Is company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I don't know the name of this restaurant, but it's very fancy, has a great view. Um, so would, would, would it be any different for SpaceX restaurant? Well, you can use an online renovation system for one. I, I, I don't know that it's yeah. an AI thing, but. Um, yeah. That is oftentimes you're booking a, a you're coming into town from the airport, you know, you're booking the right flight, and then all of a sudden what restaurants, you know, what events are going on in yep. the restaurant that are yep. with the flight. Yeah, great. So she's hitting on a very important point. The fancier your customer the more AI first your experience needs to be. So they will probably not be happy with a pre-AI solution like a chatbot, but they would need a more comprehensive experience that does end-to-end -end trip planning, experience planning. So um, the other thing to think about is, is it, a, is it, is it for couples? Who, who exactly, just getting really specific about your user segment. Um, uh, McDonald's at least has two main populations, They're the families with kids and then we have you know, the, the busy working professional. These are the two main types of consumers. So just understanding the consumers <laughs> would be a, another good next step. Yes? Yeah, I think you go really deep with a fancy restaurant uh, scenario where yeah. they like to sit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep, go as deep as you can. Um, and you could probably, because they have deeper pockets, you could possibly get to an AI first experience sooner than with McDonald's, where they might always be pre-AI. So just think about your customer in the mindset of those three paradigms to determine how much investment, what are the scenarios, and what scenarios to build. So these are the, this is just the steps that I described. It's a pretty popular methodology called the CRISP-DM methodology, popularized back in the days of data mining, but still very relevant in the age of AI. So you get all these slides anyway. So just a recap of what we discussed. Scope your problem, build your business case. Always make sure you're balancing performance versus accuracy. That's super important. Uh, tune to changing business needs, like you asked. And then use human-powered experiences to buttress your AI solution. You will never, you're, like the Wolfram Alpha example, AI will only do what we tell it to do. So you need a strong army of human experts who can create label data, who can educate your system, make your scenarios diverse, and so on. Recommended reading, this is Rajan Shet's video, How to Increase Value with AI. Um, there's a great course on Coursera for machine learning, and then Brad Smith's talk on privacy. Um, and he has a lot of other talks about you know, AI for good, AI for humanitarian action, a lot of re really good um, content to read through. How do you validate what they select as the right model? Yeah, so for most product managers, 
that don't understand the, the depth of the machine learning. It comes down to your data understanding. Um, so you, you should know, if you don't understand the data, you should know your customer needs really well. Going back to the weather example, are you predicting the, the four types of weather or are you predicting weather values? And keep that Azure machine learning cheat sheet um, to know. So once you know the problem, you know it's, if it's a classification problem, clustering problem, regression problem, or an anomaly detection problem. Just four scenarios. And you'll have a list of algorithms that are models that are used for each of those four. And then you can sort of gut check and a call BS on your data scientists. So are we saying that every problem will fall into one of these? Four? Yes, yes. Finding it. Strange to believe. Yeah, but I mean, the, both Google and uh, Microsoft have re released AutoML platforms that do one of these four. Okay. Yeah. And that is the scope of all ML uh, models that have existed in the world. We, there are many, but there are four broad categories. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, it's important to be able to get to that level yeah. so that we can communicate with the data engineers because. Yeah. If we are looking for classification what is it? answer, and if the data engineer uh, uses uh, regression model, yep, this one. then at the tail end of it just does the mapping from, I don't know, um, this much temperature to calling it a sunny day, we will never know if we're going to just look at end result of it. Yeah. So it's impossible yeah. really. Yeah, it's, it's really not that complex. I learned it, right? So it's just four. It's that simple. Four, yeah. 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 Hey, look at that. It's, it's Scikit Learn Machine Learning Library. It's Scikit Learn Machine Learning. That's what it is. So, um, yeah, the, even that book that looks pretty dense. And of course, of course, sorry, there is actually a fifth that's neural networks, like deep learning. Um, but that's self learning systems. But that's the fifth category of um, models that are now coming up. Uh, but it really goes back to neuroscience and. Um, Kevin from online and wants to know, on the restaurant case study, <coughs> how challenging would it be to get the relevant customer data that can be used to deliver AI-enhanced customer experience? I'm never going to get to that slide. So, so the question is, um, how hard would it be to get the, get the data to deliver or to measure AI-enhanced experience? To deliver. To deliver. Mm -hmm. How hard would it be to get? So there were two examples of that, right? So um, the, in the McDonald's case, it would be easier because you know there are more McDonald's and there are more customers of McDonald's. When you're talking more niche uh, experiences like SpaceX, it's going to be harder. Um, again, uh, the, the 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 right equation that I use um, for sample size measurement that answers your question is one by root n where n is your estimated market share for your segment. So for McDonald's, it would be the total number of working parents who go to McDonald's in the US between hours two to, two to eight. Um, for the Space Needle restaurant, it would be the number of couples that eat at SpaceX restaurant. It's SpaceX restaurant now. The number of couples who eat at SpaceX restaurant every Friday, right? So if you, ha if you don't have enough sample, you just need to spend more time gathering sample data. So um, that's what it is. Helpful? Yeah. Do you feel more educated in AI at the end of it? Awesome, awesome. Thank you. No more questions online as well. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much.